Aloha! Welcome to Truth in Movies. I'm Jay Dreamers. We're breaking down Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom. This was inspired by a, a panel that I was on. I was invited over at the Truth Mafia. Uh, shout out to Tommy Truthful. I did leave a link in the description if you want to go check that out afterwards. Um, we talked about Aquaman, so I thought I would break it down because I had a lot of content anyway. Uh, amazing movie. As far as symbolism, there's a lot of symbolism that's happening in this movie. And if you're uh, interested in, you know, um, ancient Atlantis and things like that, I think you might find this breakdown interesting at the very least. Welcome to everybody in the live chat. We are live today and there are all the future people watching. Let's go ahead and jump right into today's breakdown because I have a lot, a lot to share today. <clears throat> all right. So Aquaman, let's start off with Aquaman. His real name is Arthur Curry. And he is the king of Atlantis. He's the freaking king of Atlantis, which makes him King Arthur, which is really interesting as well. I do enjoy the Arthurian legends. And, um, you know, in my uh, quest for the truth, I employ comparative mythology often, comparing ancient religions and old stories, myths and legends, um, to see what resonates between all of them so we can... Dig a bit deeper, basically. So he's King Arthur, the king of Atlantis. Um, also the same king that pulled Excalibur out of the stone. Eric Ibu, hey, thanks, Eric. Super appreciate your support. He's the same one that pulled the, the sword out of the stone, right? The stone representing Mount Maru, the sword representing the beam of energy, the terrestrial uh, energetic beam that shoots out after you know every other apocalyptic cycle, the world across. Um, and you could see that represented right here by this blue beam, right? Oftentimes they'll show you the reality, right? Like when they depict the old gods and stuff, pay no attention to the actual person like this cartoon right here. The reality is the energetic phenomenon that, that, that most people don't pay attention to, which is this whitish blue beam of light that's emanating from the rock or from the stone, right? Which we're going to get into as well. Here's another example of it, right? Um, across my t channel, I've talked about um, quite often when it comes to the plasma apocalypse, not just the bad news of the apocalypse, the red plasma coming down, the earth being terraformed, people being petrified, uh, the world changing as we know it, but the good news, which is the appearance of the light, the light th that's seen the world across, the light that changes things, the light that re-energizes your very body and changes your cellular structure. Uh, it's the fountain of youth allowing for regeneration, right? Which is coveted it has been coveted the world across even uh you know ancient nobility the world across they sent expeditions out not to explore the world or whatnot but to look for the fountain of youth here's another uh, few examples here of the blue beam and it doesn't always have to be blue it depends on the gases that are being ionized but uh quite often I found that that gas is oxygen that's being released and it does ionize this bluish green uh sometimes a white whitish blue type of a color that shoots right out of Mount Maru, AKA Rupus Nigra at the middle of the world. Uh, here's another example too. ancient um, drawings. People depicted Mount Maru and you can see right here that it's got, it's sort of a split mountain that emanates light coming up out of it. Sometimes it's depicted as a golden glow and um, it can change colors. It all depends. Like I said, here's another one, another depiction of Mount Maru down here at the bottom. You can see the actual mountain, it's a cleft mountain or a split mountain. And then you can see there's energy emanating from it. This is not a part of the physical structure of the mountain itself. Here's another one. Here's another form of Mount Maru as portrayed in uh, Sikhism, Buddhism, Hinduism, and many other uh, ancient religions and cultures and stuff. Uh, this one, shout out to Zen Garcia. Uh, he, he shot me out his book and I really like his cover where he put Mount Maru at the center of it, right in the middle of that secret mysterious island. And there is a beam of light shooting right out of the top of it. Mount Maru is Rupus Nigra, also known as the Black Mountain that emanates this light. We'll talk more about why it's the Black Mountain and how it's created as we get further along into the presentation today. So getting back to King Arthur, the legend of King Arthur, right? Or Arthur Curry, the King of Atlantis, right? Um, he's also the founder of the round table. He had his Knights of the round table and many depictions of this round table portray it as being circular 
but hollow in the middle, a section missing in the middle, and oftentimes they'll actually put the Holy Grail right there in the middle which is representative of the Fountain of Youth, right? Just like we saw when we, when we watched the breakdown of Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, right? That was also a good uh, symbolic element there too. Here's another depiction of Arthur and his knights sitting at this round table with the grail, which provides eternal life or regeneration right there in the middle of it. You can also see the two covering cherubs, which are not covering, but they're underneath it. Uh, here's another one. Another depiction, another ancient painting of King Arthur sitting at his round table with the hole right there in the middle of it and the chalice, the grail of life, right there in the middle of it. Uh, here's another one. This is from a movie uh, depiction of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, except this time they have a light. They have a little fire pit right there in the middle, right? So a round table with a section in the middle that's missing, right, represented and led by King Arthur with a light in the middle or a grail in the middle, something that contributes to uh, illumination and regeneration, etc. Uh, sometimes it's shown with a chalice in the middle. Sometimes it's a fire or a light or the eternal flame. And sometimes, like in Once Upon a Time, when they showed uh, King Arthur, it's a rock. It's a rock right there in the middle, a lofty rock, a high and lofty rock, a steep rock. We're going to talk more about that in a minute. Now, I'll be plain with you. This is what I believe it represents. This is, in essence, the round table. The table is just uh, another another description for a flat valley, uh, a plate shape, a bowl shape, a grail, if you will, right? And, uh, of course, they put Mount Maru right there in the middle of it. Look how tall that is, right? Mount Maru. It's actually um, Rupus Nigra et Altissima, which means the high and lofty or very, very steep black rock that juts up out of the middle of this pure waters or this lake or this crystal lake that's located or all the way around it. And the light is borne up out of these virgin waters or mar or mari or mer. It depends on how you like to say uh, the word ocean or sea in ancient times. Now let's check out Arthur's name. Arthur, I hope you guys can hear me okay. Let me just double check. I did do a sound check, so hopefully everything's good. Let's check out Arthur's name. What does Arthur mean, right? The legendary King Arthur. And I'm looking at this symbolically, not that he was an actual physical human being or whatnot, um, just like Prester John uh, and, and others who are symbolically similar, right? But check out the name Arthur. It's two words that are put together. Now, if you look up the etymology or the origin of the, of the name, all names are meanings, by the way. All names have meanings. They're descriptors. So your name, if you're watching this, your name means something. Your name is a descriptor, and it describes an attribute of you. So um, that might be a fun study for you to do if you don't know what your name means. I highly recommend starting there. That's a fun rabbit hole, and it'll teach you a lot about words and their origins and their meanings. Now, this says um, we have a connection with the Arctic, with King Arthur, in his name. It says it's a cognate with the Greek arctos, the Latin ursus, which means, and it also says right here, see the word Arctic. So interesting. You ever see this movie or any of the DC movies where Arthur Curry, aka Aquaman, is in it? Oftentimes, he's in some cold areas. You would think if you're the you know, Aquaman, you, you would be like chilling in the tropics or something like that. No, he's always in the coldest areas in these movies. That's because he's directly related or the words are directly related. Um, with our spirit memory, we collectively remember that Arthur is tied in with the North, tied in with cold areas, as we'll see here. Now, let's check out, let's take a little side route. I want you to pay attention to this word. You've probably heard of Armageddon, the war at the end of the world, as mentioned and made popular in the book of Revelation, right? Up here, we have the Paleo-Hebrew from right to left. Uh, it's Har Megiddon, or the hill of Megiddo, basically. So Har in Hebrew um, also is pronounced Ar, Right over time, they don't really do so much of a breathy ha sound. It's more ar. So ar magido, har magido became ar magido or Armageddon. Right, similar with um, Arthur. It's ar tor, tor. What does tor mean? Or thor, you could say. Right, it depends on the pronunciation. But it's har tor. Tor means a tower or a mountain. If you look it up here, this is actually a verse from the Bible, and it says. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, in the city of our God. Now think about this location. In the city of our God, his holy mountain, 
beautiful in elevation at Altissima. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion, in the far north, the city of the great king, King Arthur. Now, let's check this out. This is from uh, an old dictionary. It says, Tor, a hill of conic form. That means a conical hill. You know what else is a conical hill? A volcano. <laughs> Specifically, we're talking about a plasma volcano, which all of them basically are once the electromagnetics of our world reverse and that terrestrial energy bursts out of the heart of the world. Uh, it's uh, Tor means a hill of conical form, a heap, a castle, also a tower. So this are, these are all symbolic elements that you could keep an eye out for that refer to um, or may refer to Mount Maru or Rupus Nigra, right? The tower symbolism, the castle symbolism, and also what lies within that castle, what lives within that castle, what is missing from that castle or that tower, or what's buried beneath that castle or that tower, right? This is a section from a um, Thor or Tor a comic book from Marvel, and it says there's a cave near the peak of the mountain they call Thor. Find it. Interesting. Interesting to me, at the very least. Also, you'll notice all of the blue colors as well, right? So, um, the peak, the, there's a cave near the peak of this mountain. That's because it's a, there's an opening at the top, because it is the unfinished pyramid, or the light inside, the, the unfinished mountain of the, of the light inside, which is what pyramid means, pyre amid, right? Uh, Thor. Here's here. So here's a movie poster from Thor: Love and Thunder, and they have Thor, who represents electricity, right, or ionized uh, gases, rising, standing on top of uh, a split mountain, right? Which is which is what he should be because he is the tower. He is the mountain and the blue beam that shoots up. That's why he's the god of lightning, basically, <clears throat> and the accompanying thunder, aka the voice of God. Uh, this is also why you have so many princesses that are locked inside of this tower because the princess, um, especially when you go back to Gnosticism, represents wisdom. It represents a quality or an energy, a frequency um, that resonates with everything around it that promotes um, knowledge and intelligence and it betters us, basically. So you'll have these princesses that are locked away in these tall, lofty, towers or mountains or castles, right? For example, in the Mario Brothers video game, you're always looking for the princess because we're basically Mario. We're basically on the hunt. We're looking for, we're the truth seekers who are looking for wisdom. We're looking for the truth. We're looking for that place um, that is a better place in this world, which is basically paradise. It's the fountain of youth, right? Um, but your princess is in another castle. <laughs> also, Princess Zelda is also representative of that same blue beam that is locked away in the castle, um, guarded by an evil force in the garden, or guarded by the one of the garden. And in Hebrew, of the garden is Ganon, which is the bad guy who locks up the princess in the castle in, um, in the Breath of the Wild, or all pretty much every single Legend of Zelda video game I've ever played, right? That's the eternal quest, is when that blue beam is gone, we look for it. We're drawn to it because we resonate it. Some of us, right? We have that, we carry that energy signature with us. We're the lost boys, the lost children of the blue beam, scattered, um, the lost tribes, etc. It's also the Disney castle as well. This is the princess's castle. You'll notice Disney doesn't have a king's castle, right? They only have princess castles. That's all. And you'll also notice if you take a good hard look at this castle, which does represent Mount Maru, which is also when the energy reverses and that energy shoots up through Mount Maru, it also creates an electromagnetic field around it, uh, trapping in all of this plasma and stuff and creating an electromagnetic dome or barrier around the island, which acts as uh, an angel with a fiery sword guarding the way to the tree of life, which is also that blue beam that shoots up as well. But take a look. Let's zoom in right here. This castle, have you ever wondered? <laughs> look at the bottom of this castle. Hold on, let me, let me bring it out a bit. I don't, I don't know if I can zoom in all the way. Oh, let me see. I can. Okay, check this out. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for your support. So check out the, this castle's basically in the middle of water. And the water goes right through this castle, not just in one direction, but let me pull out. Let me pull back a little bit so you can see. There's bridges on both sides of this castle. Check this out. Uh, it's hard to see. Hold on. Let me see if you can see the bridges there. 
All right, check this out. On both sides of this castle, there's a bridge going this way and there's a bridge going that way. That's because there's another uh, river that goes this direction. So there's a river right in the middle that crosses this Disney castle and it goes right through one way and it goes right through the other way, which means that there are intersecting rivers with a castle or a tower or a mountain right there at the middle, which is Mount Maru. This is uh, the round table, I believe. Right, my, my research indicates, and I feel pretty strongly, that this is the round table of the Har Thor, or the Mountain of Thor, or the, or the, or the uh, Mountain Tower, the Tower Mountain, right there in the middle, right? Then you have the four rivers, right? Right across from it as well. That's the stone. That's the stone right there in the middle that has a blue beam, aka the sword, aka Excalibur, that shoots up out of it because that is a volcano, basically. Right now, back to the movie. Uh, so King Arthur, aka um, uh, Aquaman, has a little boy. He has a son. Right? He has an offspring. He and this is always the way it's going to work. They always have a son, and then that son will be threatened, and that son will die, or be resurrected, or go down into the netherworld, and then come back up to the surface, etc. Because it's it's repeating an age old story to us. His son is looking at this fish tank like he's watching TV or something, and he's speaking to the fish. This fish are swimming around in circles, responding to uh, this telepathic signal or frequency or cymatic projection from his son and they start moving around in circles kind of reminded me of all those animals a, a year or two ago whenever we saw all of those animals moving around in circles and there's a lot of references to that in other movies as well like the movie cell comes to mind too but look behind the fish tank you see the ice right why would they have the a picture of the ice well, because of that correlation with the Arctic and King Arthur. So it zooms in to the ice and what happens? It's not just ice. It's an ice wall, right? When you see the ice wall, for me, that represents um, Antarctica because I believe personally, and it's okay if you don't, but I believe that, um, you know, I line more with ancient cosmologies that described a dome above our world or a roof or a firmament as it's often called. And I believe that that firmament is made out of ice. And when that ice cracks and breaks, that is symbolic of the firmament breaking, which usually leads to an apocalyptic event, right? And that will either conceal this lost kingdom every other cycle because the world becomes flooded, or it will reveal the lost kingdom because the oceans are removed. And uh, you can see so much more land because of all of the waters that have been removed due to the atmospheric depressurization. Thanks for all the hearts in the chat. I see all the little hearts flying around. I love that. <laughs> all right. Now, this guy right here, he's on this mission. He's helping out the bad guy and he starts recording. He says, my quest for Atlantis has brought me to the ends of the earth. Now, let me go back a step. The ends of the earth is this right here. I know a lot of people, especially those who also have, you know, more of an ancient cosmology, they would lean towards the ends being the outer rim of the earth or Antarctica, which you could make a case for that because if Antarctica is also the dome, then yes, it would also qualify as the ends of the earth as well. But in ancient legends and myths, when they spoke about the ends of the earth and going towards the ends of the earth, that was the unknown portion of the world, which was the north, actually. The ends of the earth was the north, or you may remember um, Osiris. Osiris was called the foremost of the Westerners. Now on this map, right, um, if you listen to the esoteric directions, uh, doing a study on just the names of the directions, the cardinal directions, northeast, south, and west, where did those names, where did those descriptors come from originally, right? West originally, I believe my study indicates that it meant inward towards the hollow recesses of our world. The, the foremost of the Westerners was Osiris, which was this light that shot out and branched out as this sort of tree of life or the spine of Osiris that shot up. And he was the first or the initial or the starting point of the West, because once you get there, you go westward, which was down. Eastward would have been up. All right, let's continue on with the movie. So he says, my quest for Atlantis has brought me to the ends of the earth. And then, of course, we've got the ice cracking open. I believe that they're actually technically in Antarctica in this particular scene. But this part right here, right here reminded me of the day after tomorrow. Remember? Same exact opening sequence. And exact same thing happens afterwards. An apocalyptic event because the ice breaks open. 
Ice is also uh, sometimes symbolically represented by like a window or some type of glass that shatters that kicks off some sort of a storm or a worldwide storm or something. And then that's almost always followed up by a red light, right? Because uh, the light spectrum in our world changes and it shifts after the polarity shifts. Uh, right now we have a bright white focal point above us because the light is coming down from the plasma that surrounds this world. Or if you're an academic, that would be the plasma sphere wrapped around our world, providing light inside of our world. If indeed there is a firmament, the light passes through that glass or the ice, right? Uh, gives us a focal point. But whenever it reverses, it changes the color spectrum. And uh, we go through a different color spectrum in our world. And our colors, all of the colors, change in our world. Initially starting off as purple, as we have a purple flash, uh, but it eases, you know, into more of a red spectrum. Um, and for more information on that, I did a video. Uh, I think it's called the Hyperborean Electrical Arc Theory. And um, it's all about the color spectrum shift. I've done quite a few videos about it, actually. So I won't get too, too much into that here. But basically... The, the world changes into a, a red shift. So it's the red sky versus the blue sky that we now live in. So they're down in, in the ice. And of course, we've got some phantasoids. When the ice breaks open, you're going to have otherworldly monsters, alien cryptids that rise up from the hollow recesses of the world and those that float down from the opened sky, right? Just like it says in... Uh, you know, different religions, how the sky will open up. Well, there's otherworldly creatures, aliens, alien animals, insects, humanoids, etc., that may float down into this world. Not fall, but float down into this world because there's an increase in buoyancy for the time due to that depressurization. Here's some other examples of strange alien looking creatures that are found in Antarctica. Pay attention to these colors as well, right? Whenever you see these alien creatures in the movies, oftentimes they have this off white, shiny type of color to them. I like to call it phantasoid white. Uh, this is a weird looking strange creature um, that has like 20 arms on it. Uh, they call it the strawberry feather star, I believe. Because it looks like there's a strawberry on it or something. Also kind of reminiscent of the grab face grabbers or face huggers or whatever in the movie Alien, right? Uh, this is a weird one too. I posted a picture of this in my community section um, because uh, one of my subscribers actually and or one of my members brought this up and, and shared a link to this strange creature. They found this recently in Antarctica and they're starting to find and more and more monstrous looking creatures are starting to surface from the depths, rising up, being washed ashore or found in places that they never were found before, right? Creatures of the deep. Also tardigrades, you know, which is one of my channel mascots as well. Um, tardigrades are also talked about having been found in Antarctica. They, they can survive the rigors of space, which is why would you bring up space with tardigrades? You know what I mean? Um, but it's because there's an alien connection there. Also, it reminded me of the Ninjin. So this is a Japanese cryptid called the Ninjin. And it reminded me of the Blimmy. Actually, if you take a look at it, right? The Blimmy is a, a legendary... Basically, it's a mutated human, right? Because whenever the apocalypse happens, um, there's a lot of different um, radioactivity or activity from radio waves, you could say, um, that have the ability to manipulate your DNA. And so it depends on where you are and how close you are to certain areas of high radioactivity, and it gives birth to these legendary tribes of humans. I'm not saying that that is a blemmy, but it definitely reminded me of the blemmy, which is uh, basically it's a humanoid that has no head and its face is on its chest. It's a very interesting study there too. Uh, we talked about this in my Omen series, which by the way, thank you. Um, many of you are, are going to my website and submitting your Omen submissions, right? Omens of the apocalypse that you're taking pictures of and videos of the world across. So I'm going to check those out tomorrow. Here's another one though, related to Antarctica, which is Blood Falls. There is a waterfall of basically what looks like blood, right? Um, that's spewing out of Antarctica, which are the walls of our world. So the walls are bleeding which is a huge omen of the apocalypse to come, right? Uh, and then they have this shot. When they go down into the underworld um, under Antarctica, they have this shot, and it's just this huge cavernous space full of ice and icebergs and, and water and stuff, which kind of is reminiscent of I Pet Goat 2, if you've seen that um, enigmatic movie that was done by a company called Heliofont, which means Priest of the Sun, I believe. I could be wrong there. 
um, which they also enigmatically took their video down, even though it was, you know, one of the most shared videos I've ever seen, especially in the truther community. Very interesting stuff there. So they go down into the waters and they see these ancient superstructures or megastructures, buildings that were created by people. Our oceans are covering and hiding much of the ancient world because basically we ran the survivors either lived or went to the high places during the deluge, during the floods. We live on the mountaintops. Every single country, no matter where you are right now, you live on the mountaintops, basically. You might have your own little, you know, higher mountains in your area, but when the waters are removed, when the depressurization takes effect in our atmosphere, uh, the oceans will be removed and you'll be able to see all the, the low-lying lands, brand new lands, which will reveal a lot of the ancient structures and technology and things that have been lost to time at the bottoms of the oceans. We have this and many times we're starting to find this, right? As we're exploring and venturing out and our technology is getting better and better. This is off the coast of Japan a complete underwater city. Academics will say this is just a coincidence. This is just na nature does this. Nature makes these underwater. Sure. I'm not buying that whatsoever. This is a structure. If I ever saw a structure, this is definitely a structure underwater in Japan. And there's many of these the world across. Uh, this is an example from uh, off the coasts of Cuba. There's another one. There's You can find these all over the place. Many underwater cities and not just cities, but many things underwater, right? Now, in the movie, a news report comes on. Look at the color spectrum, right? And consider the color shift of the focal point that we call the sun as, as I've taught and talked about. Um, my research indicates that the sun itself is going through a color spectrum change at the moment, right? So with that color spectrum change, it's shifting into the blue phase. It's going to turn blue and it is turning blue and it does have blue in it. There's a trace of blue. It's white and blue at the moment. You can look that up. NASA even has agreed with this on their website. So check this out. We're going to talk about the temperatures rising due to that focal point up there changing colors to a hotter color, which is blue. They even teach this in academics that blue stars are hotter and red stars are colder, right? Alien Guru. Hey, thank you so much. I appreciate you, Alien Guru. Now check this out in the news. Um, they're talking about how the global global temperatures are spiking. You see this right here? It says that the global temperatures are spiking. And this is something we talk about in my Omen segment as well. Obviously, we had 2023 last year that was that set records across time, historic records of the hottest years. The water's getting super hot, especially, you know, off of like Florida. It was as hot as a hot tub or a jacuzzi, basically. The waters are getting hot. I believe that the sun is the sunlight is narrowing, right? What we call daytime is narrowing, AKA the light is focusing, right? It's becoming more focused instead of being more of a blur. You may notice too that the moon and the sun, very crisp, sharp edges where a long time ago, they used to be more of a blur and they used to be larger too and more in the red spectrum. So for example, the, those of you who are older, you'll remember the moon being yellow. That's because it was more into the red spectrum. Um, and then the sun actually used to be portrayed as being gigantic and red, as it's shown to us on like, for example, the Japanese flag, right? So the sun is, the daytime is shortening, which is the shortening of days, the quickening, right? That we live in, which means the sun is getting hotter and it's heating up the oceans around the world. There's other things that I believe are also contributing to the oceans uh, rising in their temperature, which we'll talk about in just a second. So there's a council because basically there's these omens that the Atlanteans are paying attention to. So they take it very seriously. They don't just dismiss all of these omens and say, oh, it's always been like that. It's just our technology is getting better. No, they have a council. They get together. They have a meeting and they talk to the king and they say, this is serious. We've been putting our, our fingers on the pulse of Mother Earth or Mother Nature and uh, she's acting up, right? The world's going into flux. So they have this meeting. There's 13 people here. At first, I thought there was just 12, but there's 11 council mem members, representative of the elven race or the Elu, the 11, right? The elven. And then there's King Arthur over here and his wife, right? I kind of didn't see his wife at first, so I thought there was 12, but there's actually 13. This also harkens back to the 13 original, they say, bloodlines. So they have this council and this is what is said. I didn't have the captioning on this one, so I had to pull up the script. It says, your majesty is well aware of the council's position on this. He says, listen, we can talk to their scientists and combine our technology to reverse the damage that they've already done. So what they're trying to do is the narrative of blaming 
the apocalyptic pole shift on humanity, which I am not quick to do. I'm more quick to ask Mother Nature what she's up to than to blame humans for it. But we do play a part. Everything plays a part. Uh, they say, I know this is against our traditions, but the world is shrinking. You see that part right there too? That's also true. And it's also an omen. Our stature over time and in general has gotten smaller and smaller and smaller. If you study the ancient myths and legends and religions and stuff like I do, you'll eventually come across the time of gigantism, right? Even if you're in academics, you can't help but to acknowledge gigantism existed in this world. It's just that, you know, they'll academics will say, oh, it was like millions of years ago. I don't believe so. I believe it was, you know, not too long ago, but we start shrinking. The stature of everything in this world starts to shrink. We live in an incredible shrinking world as the pressure builds up and the elements are used up and everything starts to shrink down in this world. The good news is there will be a depressurization and new elements and new gases will be reintroduced that benefit us and help us to grow to be larger and bigger. Um, which means that gigantism in this world will return. And I'll show you that the movie actually shows this to us as well. So we live in the incredible shrinking world. They say that the world is shrinking. And he says, uh, the council's called for an emergency gathering. There's been another plague outbreak. Now, plagues also are signs and omens that lead up to the apocalypse. They show this in the movie that they're going through these plagues that are omens that the Atlanteans, the wise, are paying attention to. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then on television, the news anchor says scientists are at a loss to explain. That's because scientists completely disregard the old ways. They completely disregard myths and legends as having breadcrumbs of truth to them of repetitious and cyclical ancient history that eventually repeats itself. What happened to Atlantis will happen again. They say, um, uh, this is all happening in the in the fisherman kingdom as well. So this is these plagues are happening in the ocean, which they're now happening. If you pay attention, this movie is not fictitious. This movie is just a cartoonification of what is happening now in our world now and what is about to happen in the very near future. They say that there hasn't been an outbreak like this in centuries. So outbreaks, plagues, right? I have some theories about where most of these outbreaks and plagues are going to come from, but they, uh, they, they ask the council, well, what, what do you think's causing it? And they say, okay, well, uh, increased ocean acidity. So the oceans are becoming more acidic instead of alkaline in nature or neutral. Decreased oxygen levels in the water specifically is what they're talking about. The ocean is losing its oxygen, which benefits us, which actually helps to contribute to some of us right before the end times getting bigger and bigger and stronger and, and other things like that too, because the ocean's releasing massive amounts of oxygen right now. And toxic algal blooms, take your pick, right? The ocean's in trouble. That's not good for us because the, <laughs> the world's covered 75% by the ocean, right? Which there's only one ocean because it's a remnant of the flood and proof and evidence that our world was flooded, right? Um, so let's talk about these. They brought up three things. So let's, let's examine these three things and look at them with more of a scientific mind. Ocean acidity, so the ocean becoming more acidic, decreased oxygen, the ocean losing oxygen, and toxic algal or algae blooms. So we'll start off with ocean acidity. The ocean absorbs carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, creating carb, uh, carbonic acid in the waters. So the ocean actually pulls in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So you can imagine if there's more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the ocean will pull in or breathe in more of that carbon dioxide too, right? Now I had a chat, I had a discussion with chat GPT and I'm going to share that with you because I like to ask it these types of questions. Uh, chat GPT says an increase in atmospheric pressure. So the pressure builds in our world. If we live in a closed system, like even mainstream academics admits to, uh, that means that pressure will naturally build up within this closed system, right? Not just leaking off into space or whatever, but pressure builds up over time. And the closer we get to the end of time, symbolically speaking, the more pressure will build up exponentially, especially as the, the, the earth is about to give birth and starts releasing all of these gases. We're going to talk about that too. Anyways, back to chat GPT. It says an increase in the atmospheric pressure can potentially influence the ocean's ability to absorb carbon dioxide. So there's a relationship between an increase in pressure 
and carbon dioxide in the water. It says that as pressure increases in our world, in our atmosphere, the, solubil the solubility of gases generally increases. That means um, that gases take in more of that, uh, I mean, the ocean takes in more of those gases or more carbon dioxide. So the more pressure builds up in this world, the more the ocean is easily sucks in all of that carbon dioxide, increasing its acidic levels, right? That's something interesting. Now, let's check this out. I pose the question, does water release oxygen when heated? The answer is, as temperature of water increases, right? I'll tell you why. As the temperature of the ocean water increases, the amount of oxygen that the water can hold decreases. It takes in more carbon dioxide and it gets rid of all of its oxygen, resulting in less oxygen available for aquatic organisms, which will lead to one of those plagues, which is a massive dying of ocean life, which is told to us as a caution and a warning and a red flag in the book of Revelation, at the very least, right? Um, so as the water temperature heats up from the focal point or daytime becoming more focused and heating up the water from above, and also due to radioactive, radioactive decay inside of the earth, um, will also, um, causes heat and then basically makes magma and stuff like that and releases gases. And those gases are heated and they go through the ocean and the ocean heats up from above and below. What happens when the water heats up? I'll show you in just a second. Um, one of the things that happens whenever it becomes brighter above in ocean water, lakes, rivers, and stuff is that it creates algal blooms. Algae starts to bloom all over the place, specifically cyanobacteria. There's other types as well. Cyanobacteria is the reason why our oceans are now green. They're no longer blue. The ocean is not blue any longer. Over 50% of the world's ocean has changed color and is now green because of bacteria. The oceans are infected. Guess what? A cleansing is upon us. There will be a cleansing upon us. Anyways, the world's oceans are changing. Rivers, uh, lakes, they're all becoming infected with bacteria. I just use the word infected. You could call it whatever you want to, but bacteria all over the place. Now, when this bacteria um, protects itself and the light becomes too intense from the focal point above as daytime narrows, right? And it goes through the blue shift. It will change color to red quite often, giving us red tide and red tide releases toxins into the air. And if people are around those toxins and breed those toxins in, they will have respiratory problems or diseases, new diseases that pop up. And if people don't acknowledge that some of this is coming from, you know, the ocean, which is pretty gigantic, then they'll start making up, you know, reasons why everyone's getting sick and coughing and, you know, not feeling well or whatever. The ocean's turning green, which means it can next turn red. Red tide the world across, which is also a biblical prophecy of the oceans turning blood red and a third of all of the animals within the oceans dying and not making it. Life being suffocated, plagues within um, Atlantis in the movie everything starting to die off due to this toxic algal blooms the world across. Now, another interesting thing, we talked about the water heating up. Guess what happens to water when you heat it up? As shown by this simple example right here, the water level, as you can see, rises, right? This, one, this is the one that heats up, the, the temperature heats up, which is also why the mercury inside of this little thermometer rises and goes up because it's expanding. The water expands. And what that means for us in our world is if our oceans are heating up, the water levels start to rise. Not, it doesn't have to mean that it's just all oh, a bunch of ice is melting into the ocean from land because it has to be from land because if it's icebergs already in the ocean, it's not going to raise the, the water levels, right? It'll take up the same amount of space. But if the water heats up, the ocean levels will rise. Next up, next up, they talked about orichalcum. Now we've talked about orichalcum on my channel a couple of times, but it's a legendary mineral, uh, a mythic metallic substance, basically, orichalcum. And it actually, this, there's historic records from approved, even academically approved uh, ancient historians who spoke on 
Atlantis, and they talked about this substance called orichalcum, this, this strange metal called orichalcum. It goes by many names, as I will show you, but it glowed, and it was highly sought after, and it was highly valued, even more than gold. Not because it was rare, but because of what it did. Emitting light was one of the byproducts of orichalcum. They said that it would glow red. According to the historian Critias of Plato, the inner wall surrounding the citadel of Atlantis with the temple of Poseidon flashed with the red light of orichalcum. This was a metallic substance that glowed and gave off light. That's interesting. Keep that in mind, right? This was something that was highly sought after by the Atlanteans, a.k.a. the gods, comparatively speaking, right? Now, here's another type or trope or motif, right? When we use comparative mythology, we can also use that when we're watching movies and stuff as well. Energon from the Transformers. Remember when we covered Rise of the Beasts and we did our Truth in Movies, Rise of the Beast Transformers? Energon, which in the cartoon glowed red, just like Orichalcum, as you can see it right there behind me. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, let me make it bigger. You can see it this way. Boom. I can kind of see it, but it's basically that pinkish red glow right there, right? So, Energon. Uh, Energon was the, the fuel substance that the Transformers, also a type of fallen angels or gods, etc., in the movies, uh, what they sought after, what they were looking for was Energon. And it says here that it's the preferred fuel slash energy source of the Transformers. It had also been shown as food and also intoxicating drink, right? Kind of like ambrosia, uh, as well as some other things. Now, here's the actual clip from Rise of the Beasts, the Transformers, where we had this, if you remember, we had this Mount Maru, symbolic type of mountain over here in the background, and it acted as a plasma volcano because plasma shot up from it up into the skies. And once it did that, because it represents in the movie, it's not just happening in that area right there. It's happening the world across. Energy from the heart of the earth bursts out through every cavernous system that goes down deep enough. And that energy um, flows throughout all of the rocks. And some of the metals, it activates. They become radio activated, you could say. And it shows you this in the movie that flows throughout all of it. The rocks begin glowing as they have these veins of orichalcum or energon. Uh, and he's like, oh, energon. And Bumblebee died. So they put him onto this energon bed or this vril bed or this orichalcum bed or however you want to call it, right? They put it on him. And when it was activated, not before, but only when it was activated and only whenever it was activated through Mount Maru blowing its top. And all of that energy flowing throughout all of the, uh, the earth itself activated these minerals. And it had um, effects on people's bodies. Like, you know, sometimes for the good, sometimes maybe not for the good. It all depends on your perspective. But one of those effects seems to have been regeneration, cellular regeneration, right? Uh, the fountain of youth. It's the fountain of youth effect. So Bumblebee was brought back to life through orichalcum or through Energon, right? Um, this is also in The Lord of the Rings. I've been, I'm probably, oh, me and, uh, me and Tommy Truthful, we're going to jump onto my website pretty soon and we're going to start doing some breakdowns. One of the things we're going to break down is The Rings of Power. And I've been watching The Rings of Power. Wow, it's so good. Now, in The Lord of the Rings, they have their version of Orichalcum, which they call Mithril. And here you can see Gandalf, you know, in the original movie, he sort of makes reference to it real quick. You can see the same bluish glow running throughout the mountains in these veins, Mithril. And here it is from the actual Rings of Power, where the dwarves first discovered it, right? This is way back before the original Lord of the Rings and just after the creation events of the Silmarillion. They find Mithril, which was this coveted substance that the elves wanted. In the, in the presentation I'll share with you, the elves were basically found out that they're no longer going to be immortal. So they needed this special um, metal in order to prolong their lifespans. Now, let me share with you this. Sonia, what's up, Sonia? Welcome to my channel. High five. Let me share with you this. It's kind of difficult to see, but this is a screenshot from the Rings of Power. Right here, you have a leaf. Let me make this a little bit bigger. Right here, we've got a leaf. The leaf, as you can see, is it's got some sort of a blight, 
So, you know, it's, it's sick and it's represented by this black nastiness that's all over this leaf. But when they throw the leaf right next to this, um, this special magical mineral, we'll call, we'll say, right. The leaf starts to heal and it starts to lose that sickness and that blight to the point where it's a young leaf once more. And it blows their minds and they realize this special metallic substance, this radioactive substance basically, um, has regenerative effects. And then the elven race or the El or the Elu, the gods, etc., they covet it. They go looking for it and they actually refine it and they create what's called Ithildin. And in the movie, The Lord of the Rings, you may, re you may recall this scene right here where they're at the base of this mountain and um, the mountain lights up under the light of the moon because it's directly under the moon. If you know which mountain this is, um, it lights up because all of this part was made out of Ithildin, AKA refined mithril. So it lights up. It, it's, it's a, it's a metallic substance that has light. Here are some known radioactive elements, metallic elements, right? Let's check these out and keep in mind the colors. Look at, see the orange, purple, blue, red, green, etc., and so on and so forth. Just for an example, we've got plutonium glows red or orange. Curium, which glows pink or purple. Einsteinium has this sort of, um, um, you know, gl blue glow to it. Radon, etc. Radium. Radium's another good one, too. This one right here would be like a radium color. These are all radio. Radio is a frequency, right? This is all about cymatics and whatnot. Uh, it's a frequency, and the frequency becomes activated, and it becomes radioactive. This... And all of these are kryptonite from the Superman comic books, truth in fiction, right? I don't know if you knew this, but kryptonite comes in every single color that we just saw from these real life radioactive substances. There's green kryptonite, as you can see over here. Here, I'll just zoom in just so you can just, you know, check it out. Pause it if you'd like to. Here's the green kryptonite. There is a red kryptonite. And each one of these different colors has a different effect on the body. Very interesting. There's blue, there's magenta, there's whitish looking gray or whatever. Uh, there's purple, which they call black, etc. Radioactive minerals, materials, crystals, metals, which forces me to take into consideration the story of the Anunnaki, right? The popular story, the legend is that these alien beings from way far away with super advanced technology came all the way to Earth because we have gold and they didn't. And I guess no other planet along the way has gold. So, you know, our, our planet, I guess, had the gold that they wanted. And so we gave the gold, I'm strongly quoting gold, right, to the gods because the gods really wanted gold for some reason. Do you think it was to make watches? or pave their cities, you know, or to waste it? Or do you think maybe there was some sort of an ally, um, alloy, mineral, metal, or crystal, or whatnot, that had regenerative effects? And once the gods landed and came into our world, and it closed off once more and became a closed system, they knew that they would lose their immortality. So they sought out these magical rocks, because these magical rocks would uh, contribute to lengthening their lifespans at the, as cellular regeneration began once, once more. If you knew how to use it, it's also just like fire. Keep that in mind. Fire is a tool, but it can also be very deadly. You have to know how to use it, which I assume that they did if they were looking for it, right? Uh, this is from the Dark Crystal. Uh, I almost broke down the Dark Crystal. We're definitely going to do that one of these days. Um, but I had, I had some of these screenshots already. Um, so I just decided to do this movie, but this is the same story in the dark crystal, right? The Skeksis, which are basically these alien race of vultures, eagles, whatever you want to call them, right? Reptilian looking aliens that came down dressed up like clowns, nobility, and they sought out this special mineral that extended their lifespans. Interesting. Now let's go to chat GPT real quick. I want to share this conversation with you. I was speaking with ChatGPT and it says, I appreciate your clarification because I have to correct it sometimes um, or, you know, explain to it some stuff. It says radioactive decay contributes to the heat budget of the earth or the how hot it is inside of the earth. So radioactive decay contributes to how hot it is inside of the earth. And this heat can play a role in the formation of magma. 
not pressure. Just so you know, I know, you know, academics tends to imply that, oh, there's so much pressure down there. It gets really hot. No, actually increasing the pressure makes it difficult for the, for, for that to happen. But if you look at the radioactive decay, right? All of those minerals down there that are decaying the radioactive minerals and, and metals and stuff, they, they go through radioactive decay, which means they start to heat up over time and they get hotter and hotter and hotter, melting the rock, allegedly, and creating magma, which oozes up to the surface. And it happens more and more and more the closer we get to the end of time because of the exponential entropy in our world that we're going through due to the exponentially increasing pressure in our atmosphere and in the earth itself too. So it's contributing to radioactive decay. In short, more volcanoes are going to be erupting. More magma will be seen the closer we get to the end of the days, basically. Now check this out. Let's switch subjects real quick. We're going to get, I'm going to take you back to the movie. This, this is, um, this is a petroglyph or, um, maybe not a glyph, but yeah, I believe it's a petroglyph, uh, a rock drawing here in America, native American of the ant people, right? This is how they drew the ant people on the rocks. You see that they have these big old eyes, weird shaped heads and stuff that kind of look like bugs or whatever. And then there's this weird shower nozzle looking deal right next to it with these little streamers and tentacles hanging down off of it. Here's another one. These weird streamers and tentacles. People drew what they saw. Oftentimes when it's real weird like this, that's because they were seeing um, weird things in the skies because our atmosphere was changing and a lot of it had to do with electromagnetism. But let's compare these, right, with what we see in the movie. We've got this guy who's the main character, Black Manta, right? And then they jump into these vehicles. Black Manta jumps into these and they start moving around under the water or whatever, which is uh, eerily similar to what we see on these rocks. The movies are telling us ancient truths that we have forgotten about, sharing with us ancient technology, strange things that happened, apocalyptic events, and electromagnetic anomalies in the sky. All right, back to this council. Aquaman's talking to his little council of elders, and he's like, hey, I want to ask the humans for help. I want, I want, I want to offer our help and our technology to help out the humans, right? So this is what they say. It's time for Atlantis to reveal itself to the surface. So, remember, Atlantis being that circular island in the middle, and many other islands as well, remember, the oceans are going to get sucked up and out, and the oceans will disappear and be no more, as it says in the book of Revelation, revealing more land, and especially revealing the land at the center of our world, at the North Pole, known as Atlantis, or Hyperborea, or Eden, and many different, you know, descriptors for it. Now, this guy is on, an, on the uh, submarine, and they're getting deeper and deeper, so the pressure is increasing, and he gets a nosebleed. His nose starts to bleed, and he wipes it off, and, and this is just a quick reference to the pressure change and how that creates people's noses and has them bleeding. Oftentimes, in the movies, they'll show you that these people who have nosebleeds develop psychic powers or whatever, because that after the atmosphere depressurizes, Right? Many people will bleed. Some of you, you know, it depends on your sinuses and stuff, but some through the eyes, some through the ears, some through the nose. Um, that's because of the pressure di differential and the, the quick change in pressure in the world that we live in, right? Um, I don't know why it got all dark. That's weird. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so that's just a, a little shout out to the psychic nosebleed, basically. Uh, now, we've got Aquaman over here who's with his brother. These are basically Enlil and Enki. Okay, so I don't know if you guys know who that is, but these are the ancient, you know, Sumerian gods, Babylonian gods, or whatever. Uh, Enki and Lil, basically, one and two, right here, right next to each other. And they're going on this trip, and this guy's like, we got to go through this area where there's all these pirates. Now, this is what they say in the movie. In the movie, they say they scavenge ships from around the world to build this place, this place, specific location they're going to in the ocean, the sunken citadel. It's the one place in the world where the scum of the land and the sea mingle. And it's where people come to disappear. So there's a location in our world, probably a few locations in our world, where there is scum that drifts down and floats down and goes down to the bottoms of the sea, creating a mucky, muddy, scummy nastiness. Uh, where it coagulates and it, it, it gets together. And this is also 
these areas are also in areas where people tend to disappear, right? So now we're going to talk about anode mud, and we're going to look at our world through an electrolytic lens, right? We're going to look at the world as switching back and forth between these two apocalyptic cycles from um, a galvanic cell. If you don't understand the terminology, don't worry, I'm going to show you some pictures, and you will in just a minute, uh, to an electrolytic cell back and forth between the two. Now, consider a battery. A battery has a plus and a minus, right? Um, in a galvanic and in an electrolytic cell, those can switch. They flip and they reverse, okay? So the anode is one side, the cathode is the other side, right? And they flow from one to the other. There's something called anode mud. Let's check this out. During electrolysis, which is running electricity through water, basically, pure copper, which can be used, is deposited on the cathode plates. And impurities, which are soluble, uh, fall to the bottom of the cell, or to the bottom of the ocean in this case, as anode mud or sludge. Now, I've had a chat with ChatGPT about this, and I said, during the process of electrolysis of brine, which is salt water, in a closed system, how might the creation of anode mud, also known as impurities, affect the buoyancy of objects that are floating on the surface? So imagine we have the ocean, right? And over here on one side, right? We've got the anode and the cathode, the positive and the negative, which in our world are represented by metallic mountains, right? Just like Mount Maru, basically. Um, copper mountains or iron mountains, etc. cetera. Uh, they, they run electrical charges through them and through the water, which acts as a medium. The electrolyte in the water is the salt, the salt water, right? And electricity can easy pass, pass through the water if there's salt in there, right? This is how batteries work and cells and stuff like that. All right, so let me get back to this. How might the creation of anode mud affect the buoyancy of objects that are floating above it, right? So imagine you're in this particular location in our world, a real physical location. Let's say that the, at the North Pole, we have an anode island, or mountain, or tower, and a cathode one. And in the middle, we have paradise and Mount Maru representing the neutral point, right? So let's say that you're in that specific area. How would it affect your boat if you're floating around on the top of the ocean above the area where all of this anode mud and sludge is, is, is uh, manifesting in the water? Here's an example, right? Here's a picture of what this um, one of these cellular structures looks like. Anode. Cathode flows from one to the other. Electrolyte is the salt water. This down here, this, imagine this is a mountain, okay? Imagine both of these are towers or mountains, okay? One of them would become decrepit. It would start falling apart because it actually gives pieces of itself and transfers them to the other one. The other one becomes larger while this one starts to sink and disappear. But all of this on the bottom underneath it it turns into this sludge at the bottom of the ocean, or you could call it scum at the bottom of the ocean that collects, right? So ChatGPT responds and says, the creation of anode mud impurities during the electrolysis of brine, salt water, which increases the local density of the water near the anode is likely to decrease the buoyancy of objects floating on the surface in that area, making them more prone to sinking. Now, let me say that in layman's terms. Basically, what that means is if you're in this specific area, the water is becoming much more dense. And if you're on top of it, your boat is likely to sink down into the water instead of retaining its buoyancy. Interesting. Does that sound like any real life places you guys have ever heard of? ChatGPT goes on to say, during electrolysis, chemical reactions occur and substances are introduced into the water, influencing its properties. These reactions may lead to the formation of foam on the water surface. So many things happen during electrolysis. One of the things is that you have all these little bubbles, right? The, the water is aerated, basically, and all these bubbles start to form and rise up to the surface and stuff, which turns the water white. Talk about that in a second, too. Um, but another thing is because of all those impurities and muck and sludge and stuff, it, the, it's more viscous. So all those bubbles carry some of that to the top, and it surfaces, and it creates foam, in those particular areas, you would have a whole bunch of foam. Now, I'm not saying that's what makes all of our sea foam the world across, but that is something that can contribute to it, 
right? But keep in mind, uh, the death of all those different organisms and bacteria and stuff like that that we mentioned earlier can also cause a lot of this sea foam. You see a, a rise in that. Now, the aeration or the bubbles that are created whenever, you know, oxygen and stuff like that is being released, different chemicals are being released during electrolysis. They rise up, they turn the water white, which makes it look like milk, right? This is a reference to the Hindu churning of the oceans, which is, there's a depiction right here where you have Mount Maru in the middle. You have this serpent, which represents an electrical current, and then you have the positive and the negative, the devas and the azuras, I, I think they were called right? The demons and the angels, right? Warring with each other. The positive and the negative between Mount Maru, which causes the, the oceans to churn and to turn into a milky looking white substance for time, at least. Now, this is also interesting too. This is a reference to that scummy, nasty, mucky yuckiness in the ocean. Um, and also to possibly uh, the foam and stuff like that. So this is an, another ancient historian, uh, Pythias. Pythias describes, and he says, matters concerning Thule. Have you ever heard of Thule or ultimate Thule, right? Legendary lands far to the north. Matters concerning Thule. Let me make this bigger so you can read along. Ah, it's difficult. Okay. Matters concerning Thule and those places in which neither was earth in existence by itself nor yet sea, nor vapor, but instead a sort of mixture of these similar to a marine lung, in which, Pythias says, the earth and the sea and all things together are suspended, and this mixture as if it were a fetter of the whole existing in a form impassable by foot or ship. Uh, the thing like a lung, Pythias himself had seen, but other things he was told um, by hearsay. So basically, I know that's probably difficult to freaking comprehend. So let me explain what this means. This guy has firsthand witnessed a sea lung, some sort of substance that rose to the top of the ocean that made it very difficult for ships to pass through, made it dangerous actually, right? And it rose up to the surface and they called it the sea lung because this is the ocean. This is the area of the ocean that was breathing, passing gases through it, basically acting as the lung of the earth. The Bermuda Triangle. I don't know if anybody in the chat, you know, is jumping on top of those, but these uh, are directly related to places of power in our world, right? Where we have positive and negative areas of the world um, uh, d directly connected to the ley lines of the earth as well. Now, let's get back to the movie. We got Arthur Curry, aka King Arthur, aka Aquaman, aka a million other things, and they keep showing these Atlantean glyphs off to the sides. And this one was shown predominantly and right next to King Arthur, right? Let's check out this glyph and let's explore it a bit more. This represents, for me, I see the terrestrial beam of plasma shooting up from the center and a Z pinch in the middle as, um, as the plasma is following Birkeland currents. And uh, the plasma itself is actually repelled by magnetism, but it creates its own magnetic force. So those areas where the magnetism caves in on itself, the plasma will be pinched together and you have like an hourglass shape, basically. It also creates and gives us images in the sky that look like this, where you have a central beam of light that shoots up, you have these toroidal fields, and in the middle you have this sort of donut shape that wraps around it. Now the taller this is, the more little donut shapes you'll have, and it'll actually create steps, or it looks like rungs on a ladder. Here it has been carved, the world across. This says, ever wonder why petroglyphs like this appear all across the world? Let's take a look at these. Affectionately known as the stick man, the stick figure, the stick glyph, the squatter man, etc. and so on and so forth. Oftentimes doing the Atlas pose because Atlas is who this is, right? King Arthur is also basically a type of Atlas holding its hands up into the sky because that's what it does. The world tree shoots up and then branches outwards at the top, creating... Um, the nail of the world, the tent peg of the world, or the vav, which in ancient times was shaped like the letter Y, basically. This is ancient technology. This is nature sharing its, its creative and destructive forces with us, which we took into consideration, which we recognize on a smaller scale and replicated. And we created our own technology in like form, right? This is a reactor 
superconductors, reactors, etc., where we tap into the source of life or energy itself, plasma. Now we go back. They finally find this lost kingdom. And it's not it's not just Atlantis. So they're actually they're looking for the bad guy. And I'm going to show you the bad guy um, in just a second. They're looking for the bad guy. He is underneath a volcano in this mysterious island. This is all harkens back to that island uh, country in the middle of the world, which has been removed from all of our maps, right? Um, sunken Atlantis. And gigantism has been introduced because of all that orichalcum, radioactive m materials and minerals and whatnot, right? The, um, that's one of the things, at least in the movie, that's contributing to gigantism returning. So they go into this weird, mysterious, magical island, right? This is also, I mean, this is shown to us in so many things, especially in superhero movies. Like this is where Wonder Woman's from, etc. the Amazonians, etc. Um, Kong, Skull Island. This is, a, I mean, there's a million of these, right? The Lost Islands, Legendary Islands, Mythical Islands, Forgotten Islands, etc. Fantasy Island, Gilligan's Island. I mean, and there's this lost, like... They're, they all harken back to the North Pole and the land at the North Pole. Anyways, gigantism, right? So we have huge insects. As the oxygen level increases, like how we talked about earlier, the ocean's releasing all of its oxygen or much of its oxygen. As the oxygen levels in this world increase, gigantism follows suit, right? Also with the pressure release, right? Gigantism will follow suit as well. So they show you this butterfly, this insect. Many insects breathe through their skin. And if you raise the oxygen level, insects will grow to gigantic proportions and sizes, which we find fossils of them from millions of years ago, whenever even academics says that our world had way more oxygen. Well, if we're losing oxygen, I mean, either the world's just going to be dead forever and become a lifeless planet, you know, according to academics or whatever, or we need a fresh supply. And I believe Mother Nature provides. Now, not only does it inc you know, contribute to gigantic growth of insects, but plants and humans alike. The plants become huge, gigantic. And to those of us who survive, who keep our small stature, because we're tiny, remember, incredibly sh shrinking world. Um, when we go into the new world, plants are one of the first things. Insects and plants will grow to gigantic proportions before your very eyes. Like they'll be huge and humongous, but you won't. You know, those of you who have already gone through puberty and stuff, you'll be about the same size. You might get a little bigger, but your children and their children, they're going to become giants. Anyways, this is how it will look. It's honey, I shrunk to kids. It's all of that stuff. So this plant totally gobbles up the insect. This makes the plants dangerous in the world to come. Okay, so be careful. They're also useful, right? Somebody said something in the comment section in this video I was in, like, imagine the, imagine the weed that we could grow or whatever. You won't need that in the world to come. Like, trust me, you'll feel naturally high all of the time. Like we, we, many people rely on like substances and drugs and chemicals and stuff like that in the current world because we live in terrible conditions, but the, those conditions will change. And believe me, you'll be on cloud nine all the time, energized all the time. You're not going to need to do, to do drugs or drink alcohol or anything like that. Anyways, here's a gigantic rat that they come across and creeping up over the gigantic rack are gigantic locusts reminiscent of the book of revelation that talk about these strange giant locusts that come up from the bottomless pit, AKA cavernous tunnel systems that go down into the hollow recesses of our world. Right? So we've got these huge locusts that come out, they chase them all over the place. And then they finally get to this mountain where the bad guy is hiding underneath. Right? This is all symbolic of energetic um i don't want to say things <laughs> it's all symbolic of energy and how energy acts in different ways in, in the world that we live in and how it changes and goes back and forth between positive and negative right take a look at this mountain right take a look at these basalt columns i'm just going to call them that okay it looks like giant's causeway this looks like the devil's tower now i, I know a lot of people are you know excited to say that this is a gigantic tree stump or that things like this are, are ancient gigantic trees that have been petrified, etc. And I like that. And I've done many videos about that. And I'm not dismissing that flora and fauna grew to gigantic sizes. But some of these, right, look like they have created in different ways. That it's actually natural rock formations that were created. This, you can see, when you look at these rock formations, let me zoom out a bit. You could see it's moving in an upwards fashion. 
You could tell like this, 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 whatever it was, was frozen in time. It was moving and then suddenly stopped because if it was liquid form, if this is in the inside of a plasma volcano, which it, it is symbolically, right? It was all liquid at first. You, you shake up the world, worldwide earthquakes, all the gases are being released and stuff. The world shakes up, uh, the oceans underneath us rise up to the surface, creates liquefaction, AKA swampy conditions, right? Mud and muck and all of that stuff that we just talked about. And then electricity runs up through it. The electricity will attract it and bring it up with it. Just like if you rub a balloon against your hair and you pull it away, your hair will lift up into the air, seeming to defy gravity. That's what this did until it gets all the way up to the electrical source, touches it if it's coming from the sky or comes in near to the electrical source. If it's being pulled terrestrially towards, you know, a place of power where the beam's coming upwards, it'll be pulled towards it. And then once it gets too close, it will petrify. The bonds will solidify. It becomes more dense. And then it takes on certain shapes, geometric shapes, because it's cymatics, because electricity is being ran through it. And it takes the shape of the frequency that's being ran through it, which gives us hexagons and squares and, you know, other types of shapes like that. And then it freezes it in time. It petrifies it. And it's uh, black because this is the magnetic rock. This is Rupus Negra. This is a type of Rupus Negra, I should say. Now they show us the outside of it. Remember at the beginning, the tall and lofty, huge tower, tall tower. Rupus nigra et altissima. They show us this and then there's all this green smoke and stuff. I've talked about the, the different gas clouds that are created during the apocalypse. Um, I'll probably do, I'll probably come back to that in another presentation and we'll talk about the alchemical wedding once more. Uh, but new gases are created during this time. Um, and you don't need much to create many new gases, right? All you need is ionized hydrogen descending from above and ionized oxygen shooting up terrestrially, smashing into each other, um, you know, smashing into nitrogen in the atmosphere, running through all of the um, salt water that will be pulled up into the atmosphere during the increased buoyancy, right? Creating all, ki all kinds of different chemicals, including green gas clouds and stuff too. But that green color is also... Um, a place marker for the North Pole, the Aurora, the Aurora Borealis being green, right? Now, the Aurora Borealis is green and beautiful and magical and stuff, but it also represents the time of evil. That's uh, this time, right now, that we live in right now. We have the green auroras. Those will change color, I believe, in, in the world to come, right? Um, but take a look. Symbolically, Rupus Nigra shooting up into the sky and directly above it is the moon. See this? Oh, man. You see that? Right up here. The moon directly above the mountain. This is the mountain of the moon. And there is a child that is born underneath the moon every single time uh, in the form of light. Right? That is the moon child. Um, and we talked about the moon many times, you know, on my channel, not, not being a projection. There's two moons, basically. There is the light that you see in the sky, which is a luminary. And then there is the, its origin, its source, which is the physical behind it, right? That's projecting the actual image of the physical object, which is the ice above and all of its craters and stuff that, that are on the actual firmament of our world. So that's Rupus Nigra. They zoom out. They show you this uh, different pictures of the mountain that we just looked at. You can see it's split. You see that? How it's split right in the middle? We've talked about the split mountain, the cleft mountain symbolism. Here it is again. This is much better. This one's kind of cool because at the top, it's all flattened out. It looks like an anvil. So this is really more of the sword in the stone symbolism because in the Disney version, they pull the sword out of an anvil, right? Anyways, here's the beam shooting up out of the, the split mountain, the black mountain, Mount Maru. Here are some other examples, right? Speaking of the Legend of Zelda, you've got this split mountain in the video game. Um, you've got the, you know, the holy mountain, Mount Sinai. There's many different types of holy mountains, Olympus, etc. The people flock to it. There's oftentimes it's, it's portrayed with electricity, even in these ancient uh, images, if you look up ancient images of Mount Sinai, this one's also split. So let me just zoom in just a bit so you can see that there. And it almost looks like there's a sword right there, but I'm pretty sure that's Moses. Anyways, uh, the mountain is split. And there's a freaking beam of light shooting up into the heavens. And then, of course, you're going to have clouds and stuff like that because of the, the difference in pressure and stuff. Um, here's some more examples of the split mountain the Twin Peaks of Mount Maru. It also is sometimes, you know, they call it different names. Um, based on people and what they what they see when they look at it. Sometimes it's the Wolf Mountain, right? It looks like a 
a dog looking up at the moon and howling at the moon, as you can see in this image right here. Uh, more examples, this is from Halo, the split mountain symbolism, Encanto, which we broke down as well. Man, that was one of my favorite breakdowns. I loved Encanto. Um, some video game, I think this is The Witcher, I don't remember. Um, here's, a Bible, here's a Bible verse about the split mountain, right? Zechariah 14.4 from the King James Version says, and his, and his feet, I was talking about Jesus, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. Now, it's called the Mount of Olives because it grows an olive tree out of it. This huge, it's the burning bush, right? It's the tree of life. And it, and it creates, you know, these little berries or olives or circles of plasma. They're just plasmoids that come off of it. So people look at it and they, you know, they describe it as being an olive tree in, in appearance. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem, the city of peace or the peaceful city on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof, towards the east and towards the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove towards the north, and half of it towards the south. A split mountain, Mount Maru, etc. Now we get back to the movie, and um, they're showing the trident. So I want to I want to take a look. I just just look at the area. Right? Just look at the area around here. This is basically also that, that island at the middle of the world. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do another presentation. I've talked about the Septon Trio, right? Sometimes the northern areas, the northern waters are called the Septon Trio. If you look on ancient maps, look towards the north, towards the Arctic Ocean. You'll see that word all over the place, Septon Trio, which means the seven trees. Not trio as in three, but trio as in tree or tower, the seven tors the seven derus, the seven towers, um, which are these seven prominent mountains, um, plasma volcanoes, basically, that act as, you know, witnesses at the, at the table of the throne of God, the throne of God being this sort of Disney mountain in the middle right there. Anyways, let's get into this. This is really what I want to focus on right here, which is the trident. Man, I can't zoom into it. So let's take a look at the trident uh, symbolism, right? Now, as I've talked about before, I do like to study ancient languages and languages in general, the world across. Here is one. This is Old South Arabian script, and we have the letter Het, or Het, you could say. It's basically the letter H today, right? If you take a look at it, I actually have it over here a little bit better. So Het, or Ha, right? It's the sound of Ha, or breath, or life. And we broke all of these down, you know, if you want to learn Phoenician. My Ancient Oblivion playlist, we break down the whole Phoenician alphabet, so you can learn Phoenician pretty easily. Um, but this is the trident symbolism, right? We talked about it looking like a spirit or a ghost. It was drawn in different ways at different times. This is Atlas. This is that beam of energy shooting up and holding out the sky and branching up. This is Poseidon's trident, the lord of the ocean, because it comes up out of uh, the waters, the crystal clear waters that surround it, right? This is also an Egyptian glyph for the same letter, or hey, etc. Um, this is a wick, like on a candle, right? Um, but it doesn't mean wick of a candle, it means light. How else do you draw light, right? So one of the ways that the Egyptians did that is they drew a wick, which is plasma following these Birkeland currents all the way up, basically. It's the same exact glyph. Ancient Hebrew, we've gone over this a few times, but this is the glyph right here. It's the eighth letter. This is where the number eight comes from. Now, this glyph right here, originally, it was flipped sideways, okay? So our, our language has changed over time, and these glyphs and letters have changed over time from backwards and forwards and up and down. They've been flipped around so much, they've changed a lot into unrecognizable glyphs that we just call letters, and we don't even know what they mean anymore. But this right here used to be sideways. This was the ground, this was the sky, and these were three beams shooting straight up. Anode, Maru, Cathode right there. And what it meant was a wall, a barrier, a fence, a separator, a boundary, as you can see here, right? Specifically, a boundary or a boundary marker that is outside, right? So let me back up a bit. What I'm talking about, and I just want to speak plainly, I'm talking about plasma volcanoes, right? The biggest ones at the North Pole. And they shoot up and they create these beams or these lines that shoot up into the sky and touch the heavens. Earth, sky and the lines in between them, right? 
these acted as barriers or boundary markers. These were the pillars of Hercules, right? And when you went beyond the pillars of Hercules, you left the known world. You went to the westernmost points of our world, and basically, you know, you're on your way into the hollow recesses of the world itself. Here it is again. Other variations of that same exact letter. Looks like the Psi symbol. Looks like a ghost. Looks like the uh, Atlas symbol. Down here you can see this is the uh, the name of God or what they say is the name of God, right? For the Tetragrammaton. And these are the letters right here. There's the Vav. There, see how it's a Y? Basically, it's a Y shape. It's a tent peg. That's the beam shooting up and splitting. These are just different aspects of things that people saw on earth and in the sky. So let's take this one into example. This one kind of looks like the uh, the pitchfork, right? That's also why the pitch the devil has a pitchfork, right? Like the the devil inside of the hollow recesses of the world, hell or Sheol, etc., right, has this pitchfork because he has the beam right now. That blue beam has retracted. It's gone down into the world. So that's where the devil is said to have lived. It's also Sauron. This is the the image of the bad guy. In I just like to say bad guy. This is the this is one of the evil angels. It's basically Satan in the Lord of the Rings, right? It's basically the devil. This is his mark, and it's not just a mark, but they say in the places of power, or I mean, they say in the Ring of Power that it represents a place, and it does represent a place, an actual real place, really on our world, really on the earth. So this is whenever they start figuring it out. So they compare the image to an actual location on a map which is interesting. Here it is again. You can see it's the trident, right? A Poseidon. 21 Pilots, we talked about a couple of different times. All of their albums are just... They, all their albums are in reference to the things that we discuss here on my channel. That's why they're enigmatic. That's why they sound like riddles and stuff. And that is why they use symbols and symbolism of uh, these types of symbols, like the Psi. Man, I can't zoom in today. Anyways, here's the Psy. This is one of their new symbols that they use. Here's the dragon, the blue dragon, scaled and icy, reference to the Arctic, uh, the Rainbow Bridge, etc., and so on and so forth. Now, let's talk about the name Atlantis real quick. In order to break down Atlantis, we need to find a similar word, right? Atol on os, ont. Actually, it's Atol ont os. Atalantos, right? Or Atlantis. So we're going to break down the first part. We can find the first part, Atl, A-T-L. Or if you live in Atlanta, it's also A-T-L, right? In Quetzal, co atl right here, right? Now, if you look up the word Quetzalcoatl, which is this ancient, ancient god, I'll just read it to you. It says the plumed serpent god of the Toltecs and the Aztecs, right? So Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent. Many people already know that. We break it down, Quetzali, which is Quetzal, which means um, bird, I believe, right? And then Coatl, which they say means snake. However, I don't believe so. I believe this is two words right here. Co or Ka meant like, and then Atl meant serpent. Not snake, serpent. Big difference between the two, right? Serpent is basically plasma, right? So it's serpent-like or snake-like. Coatl meant snake-like, but we focus right now on the ATL from the core of Atlantis, Atlantis, right, which is what it is. Now, Atlant, Atlantis, Atlantis, right, ant. Now we look up ant, and we have the Proto-Indo-European root word meaning front or forehead. It also means in front of, before, and end. Focus on the end right here, the front and the end, the beginning in the end, right? But it goes on to say even more when we look up the root of the word ant that it comes from Sanskrit anta, which means end or the end as in a border or a boundary. So that's interesting. So atl, serpent, border, ant, and then oz, right? Oz is also oz as in the, you know, the we call that movie? I forgot. Uh, the Wizard of Oz, right? So if we check this out and we go to the Strong's Concordance for Hebrew at the very least, uh, Oz can mean other things too. It can also mean God, which is interesting. Depends on which language you're looking it up in. But if we look up Oz, pronounced Oz, or Atlantis, 
you know, pronunciation differs over time and dialect and stuff like that. It means might, power, strength, and strong. These are the things that it conveys, right? So if we read it backwards, oz, strong or powerful. Ant, right? Let me go back. Powerful border or boundary. Powerful boundary, snake like or serpent. Powerful boundary, serpent. Plasma that shoots up and undulates into the sky following Birkeland currents that acts and serves as an outdoor boundary and a marker for us here in the world, the limitations of the surface world before you transfer and you're going into another place, Wonderland, going down the rabbit hole, etc. So that's the breakdown of Atlantis or the etymology, as I have researched it, of Atlantis, right? Um, this is just a picture I brought up because I wanted to point out the manta symbolism. I think this is, this looks like French. La vraie force, la vraie force de Black Manta, which means like the, the true power of Black Manta, I believe that's what that means. So take a look at Black Manta. The mantis is basically kind of what this is. Not so much a manta. This dude has a, a praying mantis head, okay? This is not a manta, like a manta ray in the ocean. This is an insect, which is insectoid, the ant people, etc. right? Now let's connect him. He represents this power at Mount Maru. Mount Maru doesn't always represent good. It also represents evil. There's two sides to every coin, right? And it all depends on which polarity shift we're in, which ones we resonate with us, right? And so there's this powerful, um, there's this fight over Mount Maru. There's this fight over the Holy Land. It's Armageddon, it's Ragnarok, etc., cetera, right? Um, and it's an energetic fight. I mean, it's also physical because physical will follow the energetic forces. But let's look at the manta. Specifically, let's go back to looking at petroglyphs and these drawings of the blue beam that shot up into the sky, Jacob's Ladder, etc., which branched off into those um, those little, uh, you know, ladder... Uh, I'm losing my vocabulary. <laughs> like, it branched off as it shot up, right? Branches out, creates the tree of life, etc. Touches the hole in the sky, the depressurization point, the inverted dome above us. Um, and has these little berries off to the side, which are act as the olives of the tree of life. Most people look at this and they see that, you know, it's kind of hooked off at the top and the bottom there, which is just, it's the flow. It's following a current, okay? And they're like, oh, you know, this must be some sort of praying mantis god that Native Americans worshipped. No, no. You know, this is this that's due to academics teaching us that we were stupid and our ancestors were dumb and cavemen the further back in time we go because they don't want to accept the reality, which is we're getting dumber as we go forward in time. Technology is increasing, but that's not due to the majority of the population, from my experience at the very least. Anyways, that's some symbolism there. Now, this is um this is plasma discharge and one of the shapes that it takes as it goes up. At the bottom, you have this plasmoid, toruses, the olives of the olive tree, uh, the main central beam that shoots up. And then you have what they call diocotron instabilities. Um, I just call them instabilities. They're like eddies in a current, right? Plasma column following the Brooklyn currents going up into the sky. And then the terminus, that's actually where it starts to touch or be affected by the electromagnetic force of the dome or the, uh, the firmament above us, right? And this is, there's many different ways this was drawn because it changed shapes. It's a shapeshifter, right? And it will change shapes based on many different things. Magnetism is one thing that can change the shape of plasma. Just the currents in the air. Wind can change the shape of it too, you know, whenever there's wind or whatnot. And this becomes, you know, this becomes um, the Irminzul, which is the Norse or Saxon, I should say, tree of life. It becomes a bird, it becomes a cosmic bird, many different names for this cosmic bird of light, the cosmic bird of fire, cosmic bird of creation that spreads its wings. Um, it's on top of, I'm looking at my, um, I've I got a totem pole on top of my little bookshelf here. Uh, it's also the bird and why they put the bird on the very top of the totem pole. And it's also why that bird has two little circles on its wings typically or whatever. Oops, I didn't mean to switch it. All right. So here's the Gnostic version of the exact same thing, right? These Gnostic pictures are like riddles for me to figure out. I love seeing the symbolism in them. And I feel bad that, you know, they're not studied more, I feel like. You know what I mean? But this is what you're looking at is the tree of life, basically, right here. And the moon child, etc. Uh, the phoenix, right? Of course. These are different ways that it was drawn. 
modern academics will pass by these and they'll they will actually say that native americans were high that's like that's one of their explanations their explanations are comical to me I'm like oh yeah they were high they were seeing seeing things and they just got high off of these you know peyote or whatever and just started drawing things instead of recognizing and correlating plasma physics and applying it to what people drew and seeing the correlation, just like using comparative mythology, right? Seeing the correlation between plasma experiments done in a lab, as you can see here, with the actual petroglyphs and rock formations that people drew the world across. Here is an artist's rendition, one of my favorite ones, of the beam of energy shooting up to the depressurization point in the sky, which is the all-seeing eye, also Nibiru, which is why it's red, um, creating Jacob's Ladder, uh, caterpillar, the blue caterpillar, etc. And uh, that's the trident. I don't know. I can't remember why I put that one in there at, at that particular juncture. Uh, oh, and then this one right here. So they show you Mount Maru, right? Remember I said it, it goes back and forth between good and evil, basically. Um, this reminds me of the Lord of the Rings once more, where they show you this exact same type of a place um, I think it's called the Mountains of Moira or something like that. I can't remember exactly. I could be wrong, but this is where that um, this is this is where they had that green beam that shot up out of these black, dark, mountainous towers, right? And right here, this is a really good representation because you can see the plasma following the Birkeland currents all the way up, and that green uh, aura or energy. Now all the Atlanteans they're at war. Everybody's at war. It's basically symbolically of R Ragnarok. Then you got phantazoids right otherworldly creatures like we talked about real monsters monsters are real okay like i mean it all depends on your perspective but there will be mo there, were, there were monsters and i've done monsters a lot okay Fan phantazoids basically they're real and our world was once flooded with them um and it will be flooded with them again the time will come again when they will rise up. But this guy also happens to represent that same exact picture that we were going with, the mantis imagery and stuff like that too, when he stands up and branches out and stuff like that as well. All right, now this guy right here gets plasma possessed. His eyes turn green, representing the, you know, the green of the auroras and the North Pole and stuff. He touches that spear, which represents the black rock, and the people can be overcome by whatever the frequency is that surrounds them or touches them, or enters into them, right? It's possession, basically. This guy touches it. He's the exact same person in In the Tall Grass. One of the first movies, one of the tr first truth in movies that we broke down. This guy, same guy. It's the same exact actor. Becomes plasma possessed in the exact same way. He was a nice guy, which right before this in the movie, he was also, you know, coming, he was basically being a good guy. Touches the black rock, in, in the tall grass and he gets possessed and his eyes turn green and he starts killing people. This is what I call plasma possession. It's an amplification of any dark energy you might have hiding inside. It amplifies all of your energy, your aura, your chakra, your spirit, whatever you want to call it. There's no hiding. And there's the time of decision making is soon at hand. <laughs> and you make your decisions based on the, the things that you think which reflect in the actions that you take. Anyways, um, so you can become possessed for the good or the bad. Um, and then we go back to this. This is right here where the bad guy was. You can see this is basically in the heart of Mount Maru. Uh, this was shown to us in Moana when he like takes the heart of Tefiti and stuff like that. And this is also a type of um, the Emerald City, right? At the North Pole. All these people are on a trip to the North Pole, to the Emerald City, which if you take a close look at it, has what look like the little Disney, you know, dome thing above it or whatever. There's high and lofty cliffs to either side, the red flower symbolism. And then inside of the Emerald City, what do we have? At first, what does it look like? An alien, right? This dude with the big green head. It looks like the little Martian from the Flintstones. <laughs> oh, I forgot that dude's name. And then we have like this weird Ark of the Covenant deal right here. But they show you that the aliens live at the North Pole. The gods live at the North Pole, at Mount Maru, where the mountain is pulled straight up into the sky, represented by whatever this is in the background. And I don't know what that, I mean, maybe that's just a rock. Maybe it's an organ. I don't know what that is, but it represents Rupus Negra. And it's just being lit up by the green light. And then this is exactly what they show you in the movie, 
I show you at the center on the throne of the black rock and the green lights is an alien or what looks like this dude with this big old alien elongated skull. Right. And then of course we got, uh, we got the Ant-Man or the gods or whatever, and there's a child on an altar, right? Now this is reflected across many religions and motifs and stuff across time, but also in our pop culture and in our fiction. There's always, they always, the bad guys always want to have like a a baby or whatever. Now I know that there's a crazy, I don't want to get like, I don't want to allow your minds to wander too much because unfortunately they're influenced heavily by events in this world and bad things and bad choices that people make. However, I will say there's a quintessential root that this is symbolic, right? The attacking of the youth, we'll call this, right? Which is reflected in many movies, um, represents the events that happen in the book of revelation, where there is this negative energy represented by the red dragon that is waiting to pounce upon a child of purity that is born by a mother of purity. This is from the book of revelation. It says, and there appeared another wonder in the heavens and behold a great red dragon having seven horns, seven heads and 10, I'm I'm sorry, having seven heads and 10 horns and seven crowns upon his head. Now time out real quick in the book of revelation, they tell you that those seven, uh, seven horns, I believe are mountains. So just keep that in mind, right? Having seven heads and 10 horns and seven crowns upon its head, his tail drew a third of the stars from the heavens and cast them to earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, Mary, or the pure waters, right? Stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered. So Mount Maru getting ready to give birth to that light. Uh, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. That's what we see. The red light. We're waiting at the, at the altar, which is the mountain, right? Which is the footstool, which is the throne. And that there is a, some sort of negative energy from above in the form of a red serpent that is waiting to have this war, right? Against this blue light, red versus blue. Now we get back to the news and they're like, do, 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 underwater civilization reveals itself. And this is what happens after the world depressurizes, the oceans get sucked up and they disappear, right? Because they become buoyant. They just float right up into the sky. They get sucked up. Some of them return, some fall down, but a lot of it gets sucked up and there's no more ocean. So Atlantis on top of many other hidden lands, the world across. And if you pay attention, they're actually finding a lot of land in the ocean lately that were previously undiscovered, Um, which is the rise of Atlantis and the return of this island, which was stricken from our maps, returns to our world once again. And the people, the wise of this world, flock to it, running to it, to the 90 degree, to the center of the world, to the greatest, tallest light that emanates at the top of the world from the Garden of Eden to Hyperborea. At the top of the world, paradise that has been hidden from us stripped and stricken from our records and from our very memories but thankfully we live in a time whenever um visions and prophecies and knowledge is returning in full force just before the end and this is shown to us time and time again if we look back and we recall the old ways on our ancient maps the world across Time and time again, Atlantis will return. And so will I. Until next time, I'm Jay Drimmer saying good vibes and goodbye. Baby.
Oh,